From the center of the universe, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, this is the SDM Show with your host, Rob Cairns. The SDM Show focuses on business, life, productivity, digital marketing, WordPress, and more. Sit back, relax, grab your favorite drink, and enjoy the show. Here is Rob. Hey, everybody. Rob Cairns here. I'm the founder, CEO, and chief creator of Amazing Ideas at Stunning Digital Marketing. In today's podcast, I sit down with my good friend, Pete Nuri. And Peach and I talk about UX design. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. This episode of the STM show is sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing, the agency to handle all your WordPress website security needs. Go on over to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and find out how we can help you secure your website so you no longer have an issue with backups, being hacked, or your website being compromised. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. Hey, everybody, Rob Cairns here. Today, we're going to talk about UX, and I have my friend, Picha Neri with me. I hope I got that right, Picha. You got it perfect, Rob. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining me today. So you are a UX expert. Before we get to talking about UX, could you talk a little bit about how you got into WordPress and how you got into UX? So it kind of happened around the same time because I was a... I'm a designer, but I started as an editorial designer because I had my own little arts publishing company with friends. Then I became, then I wanted to sort of branch out and become what I considered a proper designer. Mm-hmm. And then by, and then I be, I worked with lots of um, London agencies. I worked for the Sunday Times and I did a lot of design for cultural institutions and for um, film for film festivals for the British Film Institute. So I, and then at that point I was doing like proper full on creative design as well as photography and other things. Uh, and so I needed a vehicle for that. I needed to, I wanted a website for my sketches. I was doing one sketch a day at the time and it was before Instagram so that's a while ago. I can't remember when Instagram came out, but it's been a while already. Yeah. Anyway, so I thought, okay, WordPress, because I hate, hated Blogspot. I just it just wasn't for me. And um, I I uh, set up my first WordPress website, which actually looked lovely because it had a lovely tiled grid for my sketches on the homepage, and. Uh, I got really stuck into trying to understand how it worked because being a designer, I was really fixated on typefaces and I hated the typeface that the, that blog, uh, that theme came with. And so I started trying to understand how I could change that. And of course I found out that at the time, I can't be sure, but I think it was around 2008 at the time there wasn't that much Excuse me. (coughs) I'm going to get a sip of water, sorry. At that time, there wasn't a huge variety of typefaces to choose from, but the uh, CSS CSS for uh, upload, you know, getting the fonts from the servers, you know, at FontFace, I think was already available, I think. Mm. So I learned how to do that, and I felt so empowered because I had never done anything with code before. And as many other graphic designers of a more sort of traditional upbringing, so to speak, so to speak, I was really scared of code. I thought that code was impossible for me because I had a lot of developer friends that would say, oh, you can't, no, don't worry, darling, you can't learn code because you haven't got the head for it. You're a creative. And they were trying to keep me small. That's what they were trying to do. <laughs> so I started getting really, really into WordPress. And because I like to understand the bigger picture, which actually is a good link into UX, 
I started learning coding a bit, HTML, a bit of CSS. And then I, I, I started at least understanding what PHP was and JavaScript. And I stopped there. But then the UX side of it came up because I was working at the time for, for the British Film Institute in London. And the, I was leading the design team and the web team was separate from us, but we were working. I was still doing all their visuals and, uh, the BFI, because it's a big institution, it has a research department. So the web team and the digital team, actually the digital team didn't even exist at the time, but the web team, let's say, uh, used research a lot and the venue used research a lot and research is the heart of UX. So that's when I started understanding what that did because no other design agency in London I'd ever worked with had ever, ever mentioned research. And I worked with really big ones, but it's just a completely different mindset. It's really typically a digital mindset. It's, and, it's, um, it's so true. Hmm. Yeah, at least at the time, because now there's a, many more integrated agencies. I mean, you can't be an, a a design agency and not really do some web it's impossible but at the time it was really quite separate and um so to me it was such a such a an epiphany to work with user personas i was like what is this and i understood what it was because also because the the british film institute is also a venue so there was and they had a membership so of course knowing their audience was so fundamental and the design department kind of unfortunate, unfortunately, in some ways, but it was part of the marketing department. So we had to do with um, audience research and things like that a lot. So that's how I came into contact with it. Then my issue over the following years was how to translate all that I had learned working for a really big organization into information that was helpful for me as a lone wolf or as a small agency. And that's, I think, where UX education fails. And that's what I offer because I saw the need for myself and I see that there is a need in general because UX uh, training in general is aimed at creating UX professionals. It never considers the point of view of a, an existing agency that builds digital products but doesn't necessarily do it with a UX mindset because now everybody is talking about UX but really it's much less widely spread than you would think but the point is that it should be because when you're building anything whether you want it or not the people using it will have an experience they will I mean it's, it's just it's inevitable you use something you have an experience of it Therefore, learning about how to uh, mold and shape and create that experience in the best possible way, which is finding the sweet spot between what the user wants and what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that it, it's in your interest because that's the way that you build products that convert because they truly serve the audience. They truly serve the people that use it. And why? Why do they serve? They serve because you've asked them, because you've done the research you have found out. And it's really astonishing to me how many, many businesses still don't think of that. They, you get clients that come to you and they say, yeah, I want this because I like it or uh, because I think that that's the best. But when you probe, when you go into the why, they only give you their own vision, which may not always, coin often doesn't coincide with that of the people that use their product. So true. And I think a lot of people, when they do design work, they think about what they want instead of actually looking at what their customer clients or potential customers and clients want. And that's one of the biggest mistakes they make is they design for themselves and not their viewers. And that's a bit of a problem. That's typical, though. That's really, really typical. But another thing that UX, the UX process does is that it empowers you, if you're aware of it and you have a process, it empowers you to actually 
prove to the client that says, oh, that's my, I, I want it because of personal preference rather than an actual reason that it empowers you to be able to say, okay, you may want to do that, but are you aware of the fact that it's going to be uh, non-accessible and therefore might get you fined? This is an question answer that you can give. And if you hit them in the wallet, often clients will reconsider or with the possibility of a fine or things like that. Yep. I find so that what, that helps. So let's talk about what actually is UX, because I think a lot of people, unlike you and I, who have been doing this for a long time, don't understand what it really means. So what does it mean to you? What a good question, Rob. I think it's always useful to revise what it is. So UX stands for user experience. Mm -hmm. So in fact, UX happens even in a site, as, as I was saying earlier, even a website that has been built without any thought provides an experience to the people who use it. So user experience is there. That's it. What user experience is from a general point of view, because actually I think that user experience involves every single aspect. So it's branding, it's marketing, it's everything. So user experience involves every single point of contact that uh, the people who use your products have with your product. So that means also not just the website, because people tend to think that user experience only takes place on a website or on an app. No, it's every single email that people receive from you. It's every single little bit of copy that appears on a website. It's uh, your onboarding process. If you have also a physical venue, which many clients have, it's also how the venue is organized, how, how you treat people in general. That's what user experience is. So that's what it is. Then what the UX process is, it's a way of building this experience that's founded on certain principles and on a process. So when a, an agency has a UX approach and a UX mindset, that means that they approach their projects with a, from a different point of view and with a very specific process, which is not set in stone because design isn't set in stone you can dis you can say okay this is the process it starts here and it finishes here and then it's incredibly messy in between it's never a straight line it's it's definitely not a linear process and um if it were a thread it would probably be all knotted up so i'm not saying that there's there is a recipe there isn't because, you know, when people tell me, oh, you should sell, you know, templates to do things, I'm like, I can't do that. I'm not a theme forest theme. You can, but it, it, it's actually quite misleading to think that there is a template. I, I have a course that I, called, I call it the UX blueprint because there is a little bit of a blueprint, but just as long as you're happy to change plans all the way through and to keep testing because... Testing is very important. In fact, if I had to point out one thing about UX is that it's based on research and it's based on testing out your ideas. So if there's one thing that applies to UX, the UX process is true, is that there is no right or wrong. There just isn't. Because even when you find a solution and it works now on March the 2nd, which is when we're recording, it may not work on March the 25th because circumstances have changed for any reason. So I, it's a great thing that it, it has taught me that there's no possibility of perfection and that actually getting things wrong is only ever a learning moment. So, so I love true. that because, yeah, coming so, from print, yeah. It, you know, where if you, if you print out a thousand catalogs with a, a, with a typo on the cover, you are lost Whereas, you know, uh, it's it, the concept of making mistakes being actually a good thing is one that I really love. Yeah, it's so it's so true. And I and I think the problem, especially if we focus just on the digital part of UX for a minute, 
that people think is digital is all set it and forget it. They create a website and they're done. So they think. And, you know, having been in that game for a long time, I always say websites are a experience that keeps changing and keeps evolving. And it's not yeah. about creating a website and being done. That's the first problem. And I think that's a, that's a mistake because I think a lot of, especially small businesses, don't always factor in ongoing website budget into their marketing budget. And I've had this discussion with a lot of people lately, and really, it's a cost of doing business in today's world. Now, the second problem we've got with things like design right now, and it's a subject I kind of wanted to touch on a bit, is we've now got the EU, the European Economic Community, uh, fighting with Google over Google Fonts. And a a lot of UX designers use Google Fonts. Do you have any feeling on what's going on with that or what's best practice? Yeah. So interestingly enough, I was on Nathan Wrigley's um, week in WordPress program when this was brought up. And I am not an expert in, uh, in, um, in analytics and in what constitutes uh, in privacy rules and so and so on, I'm just not very good at that. But it's it's interesting because uh, Remkus mm-hmm. uh, Devries was on the call and he knows about these things. And he basically demonstrated to us that the way that the fonts are served is in fact a, a privacy breach. So that the, it's not just a crazy thing that the EU is saying that there is actually, that they have a good point. Don't ask me to explain how or why, because like I said, it's not my area. I'm not good at, at it, but that apparently it's, it's a proper privacy breach and we should care because it's a, if it provides a further way of you being tracked somehow, but there is a solution because Google fonts are free. So just download them and upload them to the server. I I don't know how, because the thing is that Google uh, also provides tracking. So that's the point. So I don't usually, funnily enough, I don't use Google fonts because whenever I use Google font, a Google font on a website, then I always regret it because I am a typography fiend. I just love typography so much. (laughs) And even though some of the fonts are, are, are really great and very well designed and so on, there's always something missing for me or even just the fact that everyone's using them. And uh, so uh, I, I only used Google fonts once and that I was like, ah, oh, yep. why, I, why? And I, I, I have a type kit of subscription anyway. So I'm in, the, I'm in the same ballpark. I try to avoid using Google fonts uh, all day long to Sunday. Like I just, I can't do it. So I, I so yeah. hear that. So let's jump on to um, navigation on a website because I think that's a big part yeah. of the user experience. What's the, To me, the two biggest reasons people go to your website is how do I get a hold of you quickly? And I can't stress enough how many people don't put an email address or a phone number at the top of their <laughs> website. Big mistake. And then how do I navigate the website quickly? And we all know Many good designers do not know how to design navigation. I agree. I had to study it (laughs) because it's information architecture, basically, and it's all down to how you have organized your content. And another big thing about the UX process is that when done correctly, it always starts with content first. Mm -hmm. So the content first approach to me is extremely, extremely important and uh i like i said i have this ux course called the ux blueprint that does that that you know talks uh, a lot about how content first is a a solution it's not it's just a way of of reaching good ux much faster the uh, thing about navigation is that so what is navigation it's the organization of all the functional elements the functional elements should also, and it provides it provides navigation to the person that lands on your site. Now, there's a book that I mention very often, and and that um, 
is by Steve Krug, K-R-U-G, and it's called Don't Make Me Think. And if anyone reads one book about web design, it should be that one. Now, navigation is also where the sitemap meets the design, which is, uh, and it's actually, the navigation is not just the menu. It's not just your your um, header where you, you have all your, your pages, you know, the menu. Uh, it's actually any part of the interface that allows people to go anywhere on the site can be called navigation. So even a button is provides navigation. Anyway, I digress. Back to the example that, that I was talking about from the um, Don't Make Me Think book by Steve Krug. He talks about the trunk test. So the trunk test is uh, that you have to imagine that you bundle, you get bundled, uh, you get blindfolded and bundled and put in the trunk of a car. And so you're driven around and you can't see where you're going and then you... Uh, get taken somewhere and finally they open the trunk and you, uh, or the boot for English people and you, uh, you get out and you, they take the blindfold off and you need to be able to know exactly where you are instantly. This is the principle with which you have to build every single page of your site. So people need to know how to find you, uh, where they are, where to go back from there. So, you know, for instance, breadcrumbs are really important. So you need to offer all that because you need to be as helpful and as usable as possible. So anything that's cryptic won't work. Um, so it, it, you, so this is what, this is the basic rule. One of the basic rules of navigation, good good navigation UX. So, uh, and these are the questions, for instance, you have that what, if you, if you want to not fail the trunk test, you have to, your page has to tell you what site this is. So the site ID, the page that you're on. So the page name, the major sections uh, of the site, the options at this level. So is there any local navigation? So for instance, if it's a page that has many sub uh, units, sub pages, they need to be there, uh, where I am. So, you know, for instance, the current, uh, current page needs to be highlighted on a menu or the, and how can I search if I want to? That's why say, you know, when, uh, marketers, I mean, you're a marketer as well, aren't you, Rob? Would you consider yourself a marketer? I sure am. No question. Yeah. There you go. So sales pages and landing pages that have absolutely no other uh, indication other than the sales message, does, it does not pass the trunk test and it's ultimately unhelpful because if I land on a sales page from someone that I don't know personally, I want to find out more about what they do, where they're coming from and so on. And I always try and find out a site. Also, if you don't have a website, but if you just have a sales page, I'm not going to trust you. I want to see your brand. I want to find out more about you. Yeah. And if I can't find that, I won't buy because it doesn't pass the, the, the trunk test. So yeah. that's, uh, that's my, my take on it. And the, every page, because we, we can't, when you're on, when the web, we constantly scan for signals, but even not on the web, even in real life, we scan for signal. We try and find what is called information sent, all the clues that we need. So, and that's, um, your navigation structure. That's the page titles and the headings. That's how, by the way, headings and good, HTML structure of your content is fundamental for good UX. Fundamental. I, I so, agree. I agree. People should learn the structure of the pages right and personally stop writing for Google and search engines because at the end of the day, if they don't structure those pages right, people aren't going to stay on them. So, I, I mean, I, I so agree with that. Um, let's talk a bit about colors, which is an awful debate that comes up every time some people <laughs> like dark colors some people like bright colors i have some theories on what colors work what do you think about colors bright colors dark colors what do you prefer from a user experience standpoint 
Right. So a fact that may not be that well known is that I'm a color fanatic. And I also have a, uh, there's a, there is, it must be on WordPress TV. I have a talk on color that I gave for sure. At, yeah, it was a work in Brighton 2018. The point okay. that I'm making that talk is basically there's one main point, which is that color is an opinion. Personal preference on color is worth nothing, especially on the web, because color is totally relative to the viewpoint. No color opinion is more valid than another. And I prove that in there. It's quite fun to do that talk with a live audience. And I've done it in a few languages. I did it in Spanish a couple of times as well here in Spain, because I show a few photos that are very famous and I'm sure everyone has seen. It was the famous uh, blue black dress that to me is absolutely blue black and I and uh, you know the, do you remember that dress, Rob? Yeah, I do. Yes, it was quite the uh, it was quite the uh, discussion on social media for a long time. So funny! And yeah. when you do it in a in a room with lots of people, it's incredible because you get at least seven different opinions. Mm -hmm. And it's not the only photo. It's um, there's also there's a. a pink trainer and i mean i say pink because to me it looks pink but it actually isn't and and so on and um so it's really easy to prove that color is an opinion however on the web beyond that so beyond the fact that your personal preference doesn't come for anything but yes there are rules there are rules for instance you should not use colors that are too bright on the web because they may vibrate on the screen. And in order to find out what is right and what isn't right, there are lots of, there are lots of tools. For instance, um, coolers.co, coolers with two O's, is a great palette and color tool. And it tells you if a color is a hundred, has a hundred percent brightness and a hundred percent saturation in the HBS set settings, which are, Hue, brightness, and saturation. Hue, brightness, and saturation are um, the uh, features of a color. Hue is the color. Brightness is how much light it has in it. And saturation is how intense the hue is. So hue is what bothers colorblind people. Colorblindness depends on hue. But it doesn't, so a color may look green to me, but red to you. Yeah. But if we all see, we both see the brightness and the saturation in the same way. So when you want to create a color palette, you should use, you should slide, you should use a brightness and saturation to change that color, never hue. Also, uh, I actually digressed a little bit, but was I, what I was about to say is that bright, very bright colors are not good on the web because when you have 100% brightness and 100% saturation, Ouch. they may look too vibrant to certain yeah. people. They're just too contrasty on the screen. I have this weird thing with my vision, which is called a high persistency in the retina. It's something that I thought everybody had, but I found out it, it isn't. Basically, any time I look at anything and then I look away, I see the reflection. You know, when that people, other people only get this effect when they get a very bright light shine uh, shining in their eyes, and then you look away and you see the 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 yeah the reflection in your eye. You see of the of the light, but I get it with everything, anything, any object that I look at. If I look away. I see it reproduced elsewhere. And I thought this was normal and it isn't. And I live in a weird world because of that, but I'm used to it. It's the only thing I know. So very bright colors, which are my preference in terms of preference in the real world, really bother me online. So if you have a 100% uh, uh, yellow, you know, super bright yellow, FFF000 with black on, in big blocks or even not uh, big blocks. It vibrates like nothing else for me. 
So you need to, you, you can't, you don't have to change the hue. So if that's a brand color, you can keep it. Just take the saturation and the uh, brightness down a notch and you will have catered for people that have vision problems. But you should always check your uh, colors for color blindness issues because Thanks, there's no guarantee. And then how do you guarantee that every, you know, how many different devices do we have? I mean, I, I see different color, Chrome colors in Chrome are completely different from mm -hmm. colors in Firefox, for instance, yep. let alone different screens and devices. The best thing I can suggest there is to test and test again and try and test your digital stuff on different devices. Look at it on a smartphone. Look at it Absolutely. on a tablet. Look at it in Chrome. Look at it in Firefox. Bring up Edge if you're running Microsoft and test it in Edge and, and test it in multiple places. And then have a couple people test it for you because they might see stuff that you're not seeing. And I think that's really important, especially when we get to like design considerations. So let's jump back to uh, fonts for a minute. We talked about Google fonts earlier, but one of the biggest complaints I have with websites is people like to use 12 inch fonts on websites. And I don't know why <laughs> I, we're all an aging population. I don't know about you, but I wear progressive lenses. So, you know, there you go. And we're all having, because we've all spent more time as, people on screens than ever before. Our eyesights aren't what they were 30 years ago. And I sometimes think bigger fonts are better. Do you have any thoughts about font sizes in that? I totally agree with you, Rob. Uh, I, it's one of my bugbears as well, because also typography is so important. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you think about it, you could take all the videos and all the images off a website, but you would still have a website because you have the copy. I mean, if you look at Facebook, for instance, it's there's so much copy everywhere. So mm -hmm. it should be the most important thing. And it's the one thing that people just completely ignore mostly. And it, you say the aging population, but don't think that you need to be that old to have eyesight problems. As you were saying, everybody's eyesight is, is worse. But... The, 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 I don't have the stats at hand, but I know that the stats are much um, s more skewed towards a very even range of people that have eyesight problems. It's not just age related. And um, so it's not a, as it's not demogra a demographic. It just, and also bigger fonts can be seen, but people who got, who have good eyesight. So why not make them bigger? or uh, use um, accessibility tools that allow you to make, to make them bigger, or even just that. You know, one uh, accessibility criteria is that you should be able to um, magnify any website up to 400% and still be able to, to use it. Yeah. So in that case, then you can, you can do that. But like, for instance, I, um, I wear glasses like you and, I use LinkedIn at 120 and Facebook, 120 magnification. I do too. Always. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's funny so I can do that. And I, yeah. It's funny when you talk about that. I, my mom, who's 76, was having, of all things, and it was having problems with email the other day. And I was showing her how in Outlook you can take it and um, increase the sizing of it. So I think. You know, we're, we all got to find that comfort zone of what works for us. And as web designers, I think more people need to take that into consideration and, and realize that maybe using a small font is not such a good idea. No, it just, it really, really isn't. It really isn't. But that's why design education is uh, so important. And mm -hmm. thinking about your audience is so important. Because if you think about your audience first, then you don't think, ooh, I like this font uh, tiny because it looks cooler, which often it does. It's more stylish if it's smaller. Uh, you, think, uh, you, you think about your, uh, your uh, 
audience first and therefore you just don't even do it. You don't think about it. Or if you know that your audience is a certain demographic, then it doesn't even occur to you to have a small font. Yeah, so true. Um, it's a big consideration. And before a couple of days ago, you and I had a, a really great discussion around the one thing everybody forgets in UX. Neither one of us are an expert, but I think it's worth mentioning is accessibility. And mm -hmm. people assume accessibility means how do I make a website for blind people? And, I, and I'm going to mm -hmm. cut to chase. And we all know there's so many other visible and non-visible illnesses that impact the way people use a website. And I think accessibility is so key. What is your thoughts on accessibility? Thanks for asking this, Rob, because accessibility is one thing that I am concentrating on at the moment. I know a bit about it but I am working on knowing a lot about it because I think that accessibility is now what responsiveness was many years ago when you would build a mobile site after you'd built the main site now you wouldn't even dream of doing that you just build a site that's responsive full stop it's not an extra item in your uh, budget or in your in your proposal, it's something that is inbuilt in the site. And this is exactly what it should be. Accessibility should be inbuilt, inbuilt in a site. And uh, it's not just for blind people. I know it's the most obvious thing for web users that the most difficult thing obviously seems to be that it's blindness. But as you say, what about people who can't use a mouse? That's another that's yep. another type of, uh, and also don't think that the only people who can't use a mouse are people who are paralyzed or uh, uh, lack limbs because it's also you. You sometimes can't use a mouse, a mouse and I mean you as in anybody. Uh, yep. you, a young parent can't use a mouse. So Maybe we all they have, suffer from. Maybe they have tendonitis in, in the wrist and that impacts the use of a mouse. Yeah. Exactly. So we all have temporary disabilities. You don't need to identify as fully disabled to have a disability that Im impedes you from uh, accessing a, a website. One thing that um, is to me is I can't even believe that there are people that don't still don't do it is, for instance, is captions in videos because that's for... Uh, that's for uh, deaf people. There are people who can't hear so well, so that there's also there's also that. Uh, but captions in a video help everyone. I mean, I'm not deaf, and I need captions in videos for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and there is so much that uh, that falls within the accessibility umbrella that we need to consider. And once again. Once again, as with everything, when you follow best practices, best design and development practices, you already are probably getting a pretty good result with accessibility. It's yep. really interesting. We were talking earlier about the importance of structure or good HTML structure. It's, it's an accessibility issue. Because with good SEO structure, a screen reader find, finds it much easier to to read a page because they can scan through it. And with a screen, if you use a screen reader, it will uh, compile a list of all the headings. And if you've structured structured your content properly with the right heading hierarchy, then uh, someone who can't read that page visually will be able to skim through the content and if you're selling something on that page you're crazy to not do that because do you think that you're not selling to blind people you are but also you may be selling to someone who isn't blind but right now can't use the the screen and needs to to use the screen reader you know it could be someone in a car mm -hmm. and that's not even starting to uh, you know talking about um uh, uh, tools such as Alexa, you know, voice tools. So there's, there's, 
so much that uh, involves accessibility and that ultimately leads you to convert more. And for instance, I'm now, things that um, I find slightly annoying sometimes is I do um, every Monday uh, at 4.30 at UTC. So uh, that's 5.30 for me in Europe, GMT plus one. So 4.30 GMT, I do a uh, creativity and design and UX chat in a Twitter space, which is hosted by my friend Meg Fenn. I'm very easy to find on Twitter. I'm P-I-C-C-I-A, so um, Peacher, my name. So, uh, And anyway, it's I hesitate to uh, sending people to my to the to the link to the recording link after it's done because it's not accessible. Twitter Spaces, same as Clubhouse, are not accessible because uh, deaf people can't 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 uh, enjoy them. They can't. There's no way. So I was thinking, okay. Uh, until uh, Twitter gives us a transcription tool, I don't actually have the bandwidth to upload it to Otter or another, you know, or Rev or whatever, and get the get the captions. When I'm rich and famous, I'll have a team that will do that. So I will also make my Twitter spaces available. But right now, I'd rather not. I think it's offensive to people that, for any reason, can't listen to it. To to send a link that they can't use, you know. Yep. And and frankly, if you're a nonprofit, um, if you're a government agency, certainly in Canada, the law is your website must be accessible. And uh, there's been major lawsuits, even with major companies in Canada and U.S. over accessibility. So it's not, you know, just that you should think about doing it. It's also a bit of the law as well, and people need to realize that too. There's a legal implication to that side of it. Absolutely. People do need to realize that. But how, I, I usually prefer to uh, not lead with a threat. No, me <laughs> Just either, say, look, but, but. You, it's going to make you a better human being and it will make you sell more. I use that tack, but that, you know, that angle, but... But yes, it is definitely something that is a real th- danger. And for instance, one of the things that I do is I uh, provide uh, coaching for agencies. They get yep. uh, seats on my on my course, so that which provides uh, a a reference for their teams, which is really good. So whenever the team have a doubt, they, for instance, how to build an, a navigation structure, they can go mm-hmm. to my course and check it out. And we also have coaching sessions where, where uh, they ask me questions and so on. And, and they, the, these sessions can be tailored. And one of my clients is uh, Sotic. They are a, uh, I think they're the biggest uh, digital agency for sports in the UK. They, they do loads, uh, but also, you know, they do really, they're really great, Global clients like the Global um, Sailing, the World Sailing Association, like really mm-hmm. great stuff. And they asked me to to run a session specifically on accessibility because they have their clients are now asking to rebuild the sites uh, from an accessible point of view because they're getting pushback from it. Yeah. So yeah. why not see it as an opportunity? And when we did the session, the designers were so excited because they actually found that many of the design things that they didn't like and that they had to accept from the clients, they can now they now can say, no, you can't have that because it's not accessible. Uh, so Just a little bit offline about um, your coaching course uh, for agencies and how excited you are about it. Do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about it in case they want to get some help with UX? Yes, thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity, Rob. So it's a coaching program for agencies that is around built around my UX blueprint course. This course is a comprehensive UX course that also touches on uh, uh, the design aspects, so the user interface and so on. It's not just uh, the UX principles. It's kind of quite comprehensive. And uh, 
what I offer to agencies is a coaching module to go with it, which you can do in two ways. You can either get five coaching sessions over the course of a year, so one per quarter, or the way I'm doing it with uh, an agency that's coming on board is because they would really like me to lead their team through the course. So we're going to meet five times over the course of eight to 12 weeks so that I can um, lead them through it and there's no drop off and they feel motivated to actually watch all the course and they can ask me any questions at the time. And it's, I've run the pilot with a few agencies and it's going so well. It's so rewarding. I mean, one of the things that can happen is what I just uh, described with Sotic, that the team has something comes up. They, the clients start requiring accessibility. They don't feel prepared. I mean, like I said, I'm not, I know that accessibility is a very specific, um, specialization and but i i definitely know more than the team so it's and especially on the on the design aspect but anyway this was just to say that there may be a specific aspect that comes up because it's uh, a need that comes from their uh, work with existing clients and they can come to me and i can tailor the coaching specifically to that what's really interesting that happens is that so many issues come up regularly. I always end up calling the director afterwards and saying, look, this has emerged. I think this is an aspect that you should consider. And she's so grateful because my perspective is external and therefore I don't suffer from proximity blindness and I'm able to yeah. assess and advise uh, much better. But another thing that this does, I mean, I created it because one thing that I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in our, especially in the WordPress environment, there are a lot of agencies who build great products. I'm not saying that they don't, but they often don't have a design-led process. So and true. this leads to many problems because it means that initial decisions are made without any designer in the room. And it can lead, for instance, you mentioned navigation earlier. If if a client uh, decides on a site structure, on a site map with the account manager uh, without any designer or developer, because the developers are very important as well, they need to be in the process from the beginning, then it may lead to accessibility issue because they may have built a site structure that leads to a very difficult navigation to navigate. So, you know, one that can't be navigated through with a tab, you know, things like that, with a with a keyboard, things like that. So, uh, so many agencies don't think that design comes at the end, but really comes at the beginning. And often, uh, even agencies that do have a design team, they have a very small design team and one that doesn't have a, a leader, a, a really a senior person whose role is to lead the design. Often the junior designers may be super talented, but they don't have the experience to stand up to clients or to, to I'm saying impose, but yeah, you sometimes have to impose the process. And design is, is an afterthought instead of being seen as a process. And this is what UX is really. It's a process. And when you apply the UX process to your projects, your business improves no end. Not just because it gives clarity and it gives structure, but also because uh, another side effect is that you will realize there are so many more services that you can offer. And one of them, for instance, is, is one of them is accessibility. Uh, you can do Optimize, website optimization, for instance, and you'll find that when you start from ex thinking about experiences, you are unlikely to build a site that is just a brochure. You, you are, start thinking, okay, how can I take my customer by the end? And you start real, uh, by the hand, sorry, not by the end. <laughs> and you start realizing things, for instance, uh, how important UX writing is how UX writing leads to conversions. 
and so on. I mean, the list is literally endless. And it's particularly, I mean, I offer the course to individuals as well, and I offer it with a coaching module or without it. But I have to say that the the agency offering is the one that is giving me the the highest level of satisfaction because it is so incredibly useful. And I tell you more, the interesting thing is that this course works even better for non-designers as it does for designers because it doesn't presuppose presuppose any necessarily design knowledge and it's super useful for even for developers and uh, any account manager uh, or marketer that's on the team because it's simply I've, I've used this word before a few times and that's exactly what it does it empowers them with knowledge understanding and a new mindset and I, it, it was a long rant. <laughs> that, that's okay. That was so true. And and frankly, in my opinion, if you, somebody's looking for a good way to learn for their agency, uh, Picho is probably the best person I know out there. So, like, reach out to her and ask her about her course. And how can people get a hold of you on the internet, Picho? First of all, let me thank you for being so kind. So these days, the best place for me is LinkedIn mm -hmm. and uh, also Twitter. But uh, on Twitter, I'm, I'm, on Mondays, you'll find me on, in this Twitter space. But the best place is, is LinkedIn, yes. So what pitch up? And, Go yes. ahead. And also, uh, and hopefully by the time this goes live, <laughs> it will be done. But I have uh, a, uh, my website is designforconversions.com. Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Picha. If you're looking for a good UX designer, reach out to Picha. She'll be glad to help you. She's always approachable as far as I'm concerned. And thanks for joining me today and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. A very special thank you to Picha for joining me on this edition of the STM Show to share her knowledge about UX design. This episode of the STM Show was sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing, the agency to handle all your WordPress website security needs. Go on over to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and find out how we can help you secure your website so you no longer have an issue with backups being hacked or your website being compromised. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. Thank you for listening to this edition of the STM Show. The STM Show is brought to you by Rob Cairns and Stunning Digital Marketing. For more information about Rob Cairns and Stunning Digital Marketing, go to stunningdigitalmarketing.info. From here, you can connect to us on social media, go to our website, and even go to the podcast to subscribe. This podcast is dedicated to my late father, Bruce Cairns. Dad, I miss you very much. Keep your feet on the ground. Keep reaching for the stars. Make your business succeed.